an incident, an event, a significant event in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in Medina. Um, we'll talk about that event and the significance of it, but there is an overarching theme to it. Yeah. The overarching theme of this entire surah, once again, has to do with Allah himself. Everything in the Quran is ultimately about Allah. When Allah speaks of events, it's not for us to get lost in the details of the events. It's to, it's to draw bigger lessons. And the lessons are about Allah. All of these surahs are about learning about Allah. This is one of the surahs uh, that are uh, in the collection of what's called al-musabbihat, the glorifiers, the glorifiers. So they begin with sabbaha or yusabbihu, which is a declaration of the perfection of Allah. So Allah is stating he's the one most worthy of our worship, adoration, reverence, and glorifications. But if we don't know who Allah is, is will never glorify him as he deserves to be glorified and that will not be present in the heart so this is one of those surahs that declares this at, right at the beginning asking you and me to reflect on the state of reverence that we have for allah in our hearts and whether we really glorify allah just as the rest of the creation whether we have that respect and awe of allah azawajal. allah in this surah is going to emphasize specifically regarding his qualities his power to plan and execute, his power to, to plan and execute. And he's gonna show us the wonderful workings of his plans. See, behind the scenes, Allah Azza wa does everything. We strategize, we plan, we get busy thinking. People plot. At the end, what matters is the plan of Allah Azza wa And his plan and will triumphs and prevails over every other plan. And what Allah is gonna show us in this surah is that Allah will take the plots and the treacheries of people who hide within their hearts these uh, wicked intentions. They hide it in their hearts. It's very dark. Their outward appearance reveals something that is that is not that is contradictory to what is in their hearts. They lie. They deceive. They plot. Allah is going to talk about them. Allah Azza says, "I'm going to take their plans. And I'm going to show you how these plans." will foil, will be foiled. They'll recoil on them and cause them destruction and perdition at the end. We might not have thought of, thought about that. We might have been worried about this, not, a, be, not being aware that Allah's plan ultimately triumphs. And Allah will take also the treacheries and the plots of people, not only to turn them on themselves, but they'll even use the wicked plans of those who don't believe in him or those who plot against the truth. And we'll use these very same plans to not only cause their own destruction, but to also promote healing and growth for those who have faith in Allah. He'll use it actually for good. He'll use the wicked plans to produce a good, to produce gain for those who believe in Allah. All this meaning, this entire meaning, is illustrated in, 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 a, in a, the behind the scenes story of this surah, which is an incident uh, that happened regarding um, uh, one of the tribes, one of the Jewish tribes of Medina who lived on the outskirts of, Med of Medina. So there were three major tribes, Jewish tribes that lived on the outskirts of Medina. They originally migrated from another land. They didn't belong to that land, but they migrated there and they occupied um, uh, these, these, these valleys around Medina and they settled there. Allah Azza is going to talk about one of those tribes who after the battle of Uhud, after the battle of Uhud, formed or attempted to, to, to kill Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They had a plot to kill Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But also they had a plan um, to form an alliance with the enemies of the community of Muslims in Medina. So they formed this alliance to attack the people of Medina. What was the problem of this? The problem of this is that they had already signed an agreement with Rasulullah when he arrived in Medina. See, when Rasulullah when he arrived in Medina, the, one of the first orders of business was, as you're aware, to build the masjid, to, to fortify the relationship between the believers themselves. That's very essential. That's the foundation between the immigrants, the, the refugees who came from Medina, with the Ansar, the helpers, the, 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 the new Muslims, the, the major um, two tribes of Medina, 
that lived there, who, became, who came into the fold of Islam, plus others. Rasulullah forged a, a tight relationship between them and the immigrants, established what's called Mu'akha, brotherhood, true brotherhood between them. He also did something else. He established what's called the Constitution of Medina, the Constitution of Medina. So Rasulullah was an amazing planner. He was keen to also ensure that, the, that Medina is protected, that the people inside, whether Muslim or non Muslim, had very good relationships. And he established an understanding and an agreement that was signed with also the Jewish tribes. And the Jewish tribes agreed to it and they agreed to the terms. And the terms included having an alliance between them and the community of Muslims in Medina that they protect each other. That in case of an attack on them from outside, that they would stand as, as, as a united front against that attack. So that understanding was established and the terms were signed in the constitution of Medina. But what happened is that this has happened actually more than once. First, a tribe, a Jew, the Jewish tribe of Bal Muqaynuqa, it's called Bal Muqaynuqa, after the Battle of Badr, they actually formed an alliance with Quraysh. And they attempted to uh, uh, essentially um, uh, um, undermine the Muslims in Medina. Rasulullah comes to learn about this and banishes them. So this happened after the Battle of Badr, second year of Hijrah. This surah will talk about another incident regarding the, um, the other major tribe, Banu Nadir, who never apparently learned from the banishment of Banu Qaynuqa when they broke the terms of the covenant, the, the, the covenant of Medina. They apparently didn't learn. And that's a, one of the major lessons of this surah is that those who have no faith and awareness of Allah, those who don't glorify Allah Azza wa Jal, who are constantly plotting, never learn their lessons. Because the shaitan beautifies their actions and makes them think that they're gonna win. So Banu Nadir similarly for, forged um, an alliance with the enemies of Rasulullah not thinking that Rasulullah is gonna know to, is gonna come to know about this, and they wanted to also undermine and attack Muslims of Medina with Quraysh. Only for Rasulullah to clearly discover this and to discover his, their plot to kill him in secret in Medina, he comes to learn about this, Allah informs him, and he confronts them with it. He confronts Banu Nadir with this plot that they had, letting them know that he's aware of it and that they broke the terms of the agreement. When they came to learn about this, they, they were clearly shocked. Rasulullah informed them that because they broke the terms of the agreement, that they had to leave that, to leave their, their quarters. They're leaving their quarters, had to be banished but that he gave them the chance. He said to them, you have the opportunity to take all your properties, even the produce of your crops. He gave them a very generous offer. So he didn't attack them, but he said, you cannot, given that you have uh, engaged in treachery and a plot to attack Medina, then you cannot live there, L live in, in the outskirts of Medina anymore. You can leave. However, you can take everything with you. And on top of this, take the, 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 um, your produce, Whatever uh, comes out of the crops, you can also come back and claim it every single time. We're not gonna take any of it. Not understanding and not being aware and think that they can still attack Medina. They said, they said, give us a few days to think about it. Give us a few days. And Rasulullah gave them several days, 10 days to think about their response to this uh, offer of Rasulullah In that phase, they went back to the hypocrites of Medina and to Quraysh and said, what do you think about this? Both of these parties said to them, don't worry, we'll come for your aid. If you get attacked, we'll stand as a united front with you. We'll deliver that aid for you. You shouldn't even worry. We're always there with you. Because of that promise, Banu Nadir thought they didn't have to you know, uh, agree to the, to the offer of Rasulullah So they came back and said, you know what? We're not signing on to this. You do as you wish. We're here, we're not gonna leave. But Rasulullah lays, lays a siege around them with the Muslims. They laid a siege. During that siege, which didn't last a long time, only a few days, Banu Nadir didn't find any help. Neither the hypocrites nor Quraysh came for their aid. So it was a false promise. And that's the nature of these fa false alliances. The people who are part of these alliances never really care for each other. They're not sincere. 
they're, they're very selfish. And Allah reveals the truth of their hearts. So the hypocrites of Medina and Quraysh never really cared for Banu Nadir. They were there for their own selfish interests. Banu Nadir didn't realize this. They were there also for their selfish interests. They signed this wicked treaty and they hung on to it. And they still refused the generous offer of Rasulullah and they insisted on staying. Rasulullah lays the siege and they break down. That was the plan of Allah. They broke down and their hearts, as Allah says in, in this surah, were filled with terror. Filled with terror. Allah put terror in their hearts. And they, at the end, they said, okay, we'll leave. We'll leave when they realized there was no aid or help coming from anyone. Coming from no one that they thought was a friend of theirs. They end up being banished and they leave Medina. They take whatever they can take and they leave their properties behind. So Allah Azza wa highlights the story in the surah emphasizing this this very uh, significant theme of where the hearts lie ultimately see in the last surah that we covered surah al-mujadil allah spoke of two parties the party of the shaitan and the ones that belong to it are ones whose hearts are not aware of allah blind to allah they think reality is confined to this world and their only aim is to gain more and more. So they follow the whispers and the false promises of the shaitan, thinking that they're going to win. Even when they speak of believing in God, believing in Allah, it's only words that are uttered, uttered on their tongues. But it has no reality in the hearts. Allah calls them the party of the shaitan. On the other hand, Allah describes to us and gives us a beautiful portrait of those who have faith in Allah Azza wa Jalla party of those who believe in Allah the party of those who are loyal and dedicated to Allah saying these are the ones who win in this world and in the hereafter because they've signed that agreement with Allah and they're aware that life is bigger than this world so Allah was asking us in that that sort of where is your loyalty where is your heart so this surah surah al-hashr the gathering comes to present to us an example a vivid living example of a people whose hearts are with Allah. And what happens to them? The believers of Medina and the immigrants and those whose hearts disbelieve in Allah despite what they say outwardly. They're wicked. They hide these selfish motives and the perdition and the destruction that happens to them at the hands of Allah because it's ultimately the plan of Allah who executes all of this. When the Banu Nadir were banished, that's one of the ends that Allah accomplished in his ways. By the way, there is no war that happened. The siege caused, you know, caused no loss of blood whatsoever. The believers didn't know that. They thought they were going to war. But Allah executed this plan without a, a single person being harmed, without a single drop of blood being spilled because he placed terror and fear in the hearts of Banu Nadir that they left on their own after they realized that you know, they had nowhere to go and there was no aid coming. The same plan of Allah, that executed this, created stronger bonds between the believers of Medina, the Muslims of Medina, the newcomers, and the immigrants. That also they didn't realize. That was also the plan of Allah. And we'll speak about how this entire event and trial brought their hearts together. See, we think something is harmful, but it ends up being a great gain because it's the work of Allah Azza wa So let us begin the surah. The surah is, as, as I said, is... Um, uh, a surah that belongs in the collection of what's called Al-Musabbihat, the glorifiers, that begin with the tasbih of Allah. So Allah begins the surah by declaration. The surah is about Allah. It begins with him and ends with him. And then it tells us the story. Allah begins it by saying, سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Allah says everything in the heavens and in earth glorifies Allah. We don't understand the, those glorifications. Every single thing, we spoke about it in the last surah, but it's important to remember this. Everything in the heavens and the earth, the angels, the creation in the heavens that we don't know about, infinite in number. Every single thing on this earth that is hidden underneath this earth and on top of this earth and or in the environment and in the atmosphere and beyond it, in the cosmos. Every single thing from the littlest thing that we cannot see and the microbes and the viruses and the birds that sing in the morning and the sky and the clouds and you and me ourselves do, right? Glorify Allah because they're aware of Allah aware 
of Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah says he is the most exalted, the infinitely wise, the most exalted, the infinitely wise. Now we're going to notice that these two names of Allah that Allah placed in the first verse are going to wrap up the surah, verse 24. Allah begins the surah by declaring that he is to be worshipped and glorified and everything already does, whether you and I do it or not. It doesn't matter. Allah says everything else is aware of Allah. Because he's the most exalted, this is a very essential quality. Allah has full sovereignty. Everything needs Allah and he doesn't need everyone. Allah is asking us, are you aware of that? If that meaning is in the heart, then it is going to change our lives. We're really going to dedicate our lives to Allah. We're going to realize he's the, he's the beginning and he's the end. He's the end of it all. And he's the, he's, his will is the only one that, will that, matter, that matters. When you realize we really have no power, no ability, it all belongs to Allah. He's the most exalted. The one who has full ownership and sovereignty of everything then why would people engage in wicked plans and plots? Why would people really lie? Why would people hurt each other? Why would people defy the truth? So Allah is asking us, is this meaning in your heart? If it is, your life will change. If it is absent from the heart, then we're going to engage in all the wicked, evil things that people engage in on this earth because they're not aware of Allah's sovereignty. They think they have sovereignty. They have power. So they engage in these behaviors and they follow the whispers and the delusions that the shaitan puts in them. It's all false promises. And people feed themselves these false, false promises and they think they're going to win. Allah says they'll never win. The plan of Allah triumphs at the end. And he's Hakim. Another essential meaning in this surah. His plans are infinitely wise. People plot and Allah has plans. Whose plan works? Allah's plan. But Allah's plan is not, has no flaws in it has no evil in it. It's all good. And it has an infinite wisdom that you and I do not understand. So when we're going through difficult things in life, things that we do not understand, Allah says, hang in there and be patient because that plan is the plan of Allah. When we're going through trials, like the one that we're going through, we do not understand the meaning of it fully. We might grasp something from the surface of it. Allah says, hang in there and endure and be patient. Surrender to Allah. You are in the hands of Allah. And this whole plan is Allah's plan. And the end of it is an infinite good that you and I do not understand. Al-Aziz al-Hakim. If we really understood this, wouldn't we gain peace? Wouldn't we say SubhanAllah? Allah in first verse one is asking you and me to say SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. But to say it out of awareness that he is the most exalted, infinitely wise, so that we are, we're in peace. We surrender to him. Indeed, it should be a declaration Different than other declarations of, 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 of a glorification to Allah that comes out of our hearts. Then he gives us a description of how he is Al-Aziz Al-Hakim. How he is really the exalted one who has infinite authority, the only authority, and the infinite wisdom by shedding light on the story of the treachery of Banu Nadir. He says, He, Allah, the only one who did there is no one but Allah. Huwa. The only reality, the only truth is Allah. Everything else is a creation of Allah. That doesn't really matter. Allah says, it is he, not you and me. He says to the believers of Medina, to Rasulullah it's not you who expelled them. It is not you who executed that plan. It's really Allah. It is him who drove out those who disbelieved from the people of the book, meaning Banu Nadir. They really had no belief in Allah. They belong to the people of the book, but inside of them, they were very treacherous people. They didn't really have belief in God. He said, it is him who drove them out. You thought they are not going to leave. See, the, the Muslims of Medina were concerned. These people were plotting against them. They're plotting destruction. They're plotting to attack them. They thought they had a lot of power. And they thought they will never leave. When they asked them, to leave after they discovered their treachery. You thought they're not going to leave, that they're going to stay there and fight you back. And uh, he, Allah says, says, He revealed another thing in the hearts of Banu Nadir. Allah revealed what was in the heart of the Muslims. You see, we have thoughts in our, in our hearts and beliefs and opinions and emotions. We think nobody else knows about them. Allah says, I know what's in your heart. I know that you thought that they're not going to leave. That was your fear. And I also know that the Banu Nadir, that tribe, 
thought that they were going to be protected by their fortified uh, fortresses, their strong fortresses. That's why they hung in there. Also, they thought they had an, uh, you know, helpers coming through, through their alliance, which never came. But they also thought we're fortified in our positions in, 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 in the quarters that they've occupied around Medina. So nobody can ever uh, prevail over us. We're really strong and protected. These fortresses that protect um, our area, they're not going to be taken down by anyone. They're very strong. Allah says they had no idea. They thought that these fortresses will protect him, but they had no idea that it was Allah himself who's going to, uh, who's going to essentially unleash hell on them, right? Who's going to uh, send the attack upon them from places they least expect and that nobody can ever stand against the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he says, The wrath of Allah came to them. The wrath of Allah came to them from places they least expect. They had no idea how Allah is going to execute his plan. So when the Muslims laid the siege, what did Allah do? Did, did a very simple thing. All he did was place fear in the hearts of Banu Nabi. That's it. So the Muslims were outside. No fighting happened. When they saw the Muslims and they saw that they were surrounded, suddenly their fortresses didn't matter. They didn't even think of their fortresses. Now who alters the hearts? Allah Azza wa That's what Allah is telling us. Don't be worried about strategies and plans and so forth. At the end, Allah controls the hearts. All that Allah has to do is put fear in somebody's hearts. And when he placed that fear in their hearts, they lost it. And they decided to leave themselves. That was the plan of Allah, remember? He exalted Al-Aziz, who has full authority and sovereignty, who's also the infinitely wise. That was the wise plan of Allah Azza wa Jal. So Allah says, So Allah first placed that terror in their hearts. And then he says, they destroyed their own homes by their own hands and the hands of the believers. Meaning that they're the ones who engage in the treachery. They thought that the treachery will produce a gain for them but it ended up producing a severe loss and destruction. They had to leave. They had no idea. So they destroyed their own community and their own homes or their own hands, right? They signed that kind of uh, 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 ultimate um, fate for themselves. They sealed it for themselves with their own actions, which were really insinuated to them by the shaitan. So he says, All people who have vision, who have understanding, why don't you learn? Do we ever learn? Did Banu Nadir learn from Banu Qaynuqa, a previous tribe who was also banished because they broke a covenant. They were treacherous. They plotted in secret to attack Medina. They ended up being banished, but they never learned. And that's the nature of hearts that are blind, hearts that follow the shaitan. They can never understand or learn from any lessons. So Allah is asking you, Amit, are we learning? that it's really the hand of Allah that prevails over all of all of the other hands, all of the other wills, but that Allah can really change hearts and Allah can produce the outcomes and execute his plans in mysterious ways. And in this case, all he did was terrify some hearts. And because of that, the end, of, the end result of Allah was accomplished thoroughly and completely. Then Allah Azza wa Jal says, if it wasn't for Allah, was decreed this banishment upon Banu Nadir, they would have actually received a, a stronger wrath or stronger punishment from Allah Azza wa meaning that whatever happened to Banu Nadir was nothing. Allah say, says, um, what, they end, what they experienced was nothing. That was actually a slap on the hand for them to learn. So Allah is very merciful even with them, with the tribe that was banished. Allah slapped them on their hands and didn't even cause any of them to be harmed. And they ended up leaving in the hope that they would learn something. Allah says, if it wasn't for this, you would have received a greater punishment and wrath from Allah Azza wa Jal. But learn before it's too late when you meet Allah and there's something called the torment of the hellfire. And Allah says next in verse four, he did what he did to them. Why? Because they are, there are people who what? شَاقُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ شَاقُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ because they opposed, they rebelled against Allah and His Rasul. Rebellion is in the heart. Rebellion is from the shaitan. When people have that intention in their hearts, and they plot accordingly, thinking that they're going to win, Allah Azza says, what, what's waiting for you 
is the severe punishment of Allah. Remember, Allah will not change this, will not change his plan. That's the real promise of Allah Azza wa Whenever you observe anyone plotting against truth, don't worry. Allah is there. Allah is aware of it. Allah simultaneously has his plan and his plan to foil that plot, that wickedness, that evil, for sure will triumph, for sure will prevail, even if it's after a while. So Allah is asking all of us to learn and be patient. Then Allah says in verse 5, مَا خَطَعْتُمْ مِلِّينَ أَوْ تَرَثْتُمْهَا قَائِمَةً عَلَىٰ أُصُولِهَا فَبِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَلِيُخْزِيَ الْفَاسِقِينَ He said there is not um, you know, a, a tree that you cut or that you left standing except by the permission of Allah. So here's what happened. When the Muslims laid siege around Banu Nadir, they laid a, they laid a siege around their, their town. Allah Azza wa commanded Rasulullah to start cutting trees. Now we are aware that in war, according to the, uh, to the beautiful teachings and the virtues established in the Quran for even the conduct of war, nobody is to cut a tree. Nobody is to harm an animal. Nobody is to harm any child or any, the elderly or a woman, right? Even, you know, the, the, the war itself is so, um, gu it, it's guided by these very strict divine principles and parameters to minimize any harm whatsoever. This is the, the beauty of our faith is that even in the conduct of war, a just war, that those fighting have to uphold the strictest, the strictest limits to minimize harm, that not even a tree can be cut or a leaf can be shed. That's the teaching of Allah Azza In this case, Allah did something. He said, okay, to minimize harm, I want you to start cutting their trees on the outskirts of Medina because they love these palm trees so much. So start cutting some of them and leave others standing. Why is that? Allah wanted them to start cutting some trees to put pressure on them, to put that fear in their hearts. So Allah says, even when you cut that tree, it's by the permission of Allah. It's set by a limit for Allah. Don't exceed it. So let's say cut 10 trees. That's it. Cut 10 trees and don't overdo it. Don't exceed the limit. So even when Allah gives the permission, it has parameters. Don't exceed it. That's an amazing thing. So the cutting of the trees in this case was for a greater good because we're not supposed to cut trees whatsoever. No destruction to earth, to the environment, to the animals, to the insects. None. It, uh, it's the law of Allah Azza wa These are the red lines of Allah Azza wa So we're being asked to be conscious of Allah, even in cases like this. And Allah reminded them, the cutting of the tree or leaving other trees standing is by the permission of Allah Azza wa It's not up to you. That's an amazing prescription for conduct in times of war and even in times of a siege. But Allah has his plan. And remember, he permitted them to do this, or he, he commanded them to do this for a greater good so that the tribe becomes fearful and leave without any, any fighting. Then Allah Azza wa um, gives us few verses in which he speaks of the distribution of the spoils uh, of that event when, when Banu Nadir left. When Banu Nadir left, they left a lot of things behind. Initially, Rasulullah told them they can take everything. But after they resisted, the offer of Rasulullah and they still insisted on um, their alliance with Quraysh and, and the hypocrites of Medina who promised them that they're, they're going to be coming. They said, no, no, we're not going to go anywhere. Remember, they plotted to kill Rasulullah so, so he told them, you can leave and take everything with you. Even the produce of your crops, you can take it and come back and collect it next year. When they refused, Rasulullah said, you cannot take that. You cannot take the, uh, the produce of your crops. You can take your properties but a lot of it, they couldn't take a lot of it as well, like their weapons, etc. So they had to leave that. So the next few verses speaks of how those um, confiscated properties are to be distributed. Even that is according to the teachings of Allah. It's not up to the, the Muslims of Medina to just say, we're going to distribute this in the way we want. What happens usually in cases like this is that the wealthy and the powerful and the rich end up taking everything. Or they decide, well, we're going to take this and the poor get that. Allah says it's not up to you. It is up to Allah. So Allah decided the formula for the equitable distribution of the confiscated properties. And it ends up being for who? For the poor. Allah says it's going to be for the poor, for the needy, for the passerby, 
And it's not for the wealthy, subhanAllah. Allah wants to aid people, promote their healing, fulfill their needs. Then Allah Azza specifically mentioned the category of people that were going to receive the spoils of that. Uh, there was no war, of the siege. In verse 8, eight, eight Allah says, Allah says, Allah says, the confiscated property is going to go to the immigrants, the refugees. Why? Allah says, remember these refugees, the Muslims who immigrated from Mecca. Think of their sacrifice. They, have, they were so devoted to Allah. They loved Allah so much that they were willing to leave behind all their properties in Mecca. Many of them lost their lives, right? They had to um, imagine standing in the face of a very wicked and powerful enemy. Quraysh. And because of their love of Allah Rasulullah, they're willing to leave their towns, leave even many of their relatives, families, leave their properties and go to Medina. So their sacrifice was unparalleled. And their loyalty, that Allah was aware of it, was in their hearts, was something so beautiful and so um, dear to Allah that Allah says, I'm going to compensate them a little bit here. A little bit. So the spoils that were collected from the banishment of Banu Nadir is going to go to them. Now, clearly they're going to be happy. They received something. They lost everything. Now suddenly there are some spoils of war in the third year of it, you know, after migration, they suddenly have, can have, can enjoy something back from Allah, provision from Allah and a decision of Allah. Now what can that cause in the hearts of the people of Medina? Imagine they've just received an instruction from Allah that the spoils, the confiscated property is going to go to the immigrants, that they're not going to get anything. The people of Medina were not going to get anything. How will that make them feel? Naturally, the human being will feel jealous, will feel upset, will feel bitter towards the immigrants, towards the refugees that they welcomed. Remember, the people of Medina welcomed them into their homes. And now on top of this, Allah gives them more. They must be thinking probably, I'm bitter, I'm angry. That's a natural reaction to the human being. Allah says they didn't. They didn't. These people were such... Uh, strong believers and their sincerity was so uh, so beautiful so pure that they were actually instead of being jealous and angry and upset they were actually very happy they preferred the immigrants over themselves so Allah praises the people of Medina the Ansar the helpers by saying he praised them. And what a beautiful thing to receive a praise from Allah. He said, these people of Medina who um, entered into the faith um, and lived in Medina, they love the immigrants and they don't find in their hearts any need for the confiscated properties. They said, you know what? We don't need this. The immigrants need it. And they preferred the immigrants over themselves, even if they were poor. See, the people of Medina, many of them are also poor, but they didn't care. They said, you know what? The confiscated property, the people, the immigrants deserve it better than us. And they, find, they found joy in their hearts. That's an incredible thing. That they reacted with joy in their hearts and pleasure and contentment that the immigrants, their needs were met. Allah says, you had no idea. You see the whole plan, remember? It was from the infinitely wise. The... The end result was the banishment of Banu Nadir, destruction essentially for the people who plot, they end up losing, but also a fortification of the bonds of love and affection between the immigrants and the people of Medina. Only Allah could have accomplished this from this event. Only Allah. And Allah says these people are really the winners. But Allah's work was taking place in the hearts as well without anybody knowing. The people of Medina and the immigrants had no idea that Allah will even strengthen their bonds through this trial. And he said further regarding the people of Medina, that they did something else that we all can learn from. In verse 10, Allah says, The Allah says regarding the people of Medina, in continuing his praise over them. Those who came after them, meaning after the initial group of Muslims, the first 
band of Muslims that entered into Islam from Mecca. There is another band in Medina. The ones who came later, not the first generation, they make a dua that Allah records in verse 10. They say, O oh, our master, O oh, our master, grant us forgiveness. Allah is showing us their concern. He's saying, these people, you don't know what they're doing. They're actually making dua to Allah without you even seeing and knowing. And their dua is this, and Allah is recording their dua. He's saying, they are saying in their duas, Ya Allah, forgive us. But not only that, they didn't just pray for themselves. You remember, they were so unselfish. We've seen that. They were so happy when the immigrants received, as dictated by Allah, the confiscated properties. And they had none of it. They couldn't get anything themselves. Allah told us they were happy. That happiness is in the heart. It's only known to Allah Azza wa Jal. They were not lying when they were saying they were happy. But they were also doing another action, a dua, constantly. And their dua is, Ya Allah, forgive us. But they're not selfish people. They didn't ask just for forgiveness for themselves. And so they said, Allah tells us, Wali ikhwanina. And Ya Allah, forgive our brothers who came into Islam before us, meaning the people of Mecca, the immigrants from Mecca. They loved them so much that they were making dua for them, that Allah forgives them. And they were acknowledging the good that they have done. You see, these people who came before us were Muslim before us. So it's a statement in which they affirm, they acknowledge that the people that came before them has virtue on top of them or above them. These people are really good. They're saying the people that immigrated to Medina are such good people that they came into Islam before us. Ya Allah, forgive them. Ya Allah, have mercy on them. They don't stop. They're also concerned about something in their hearts. They're concerned that they'll have some jealousy, rancor against that group of Muslims. See, many of us might think like, oh, these people, they got all this confiscated property. They have an edge on us because they came into Islam more. So it can breed a sense of jealousy, a sense of jealousy. People, you know, experience jealousy all the time when we see somebody doing something better than what we do. When somebody is ahead of us, somebody is having greater success, etc. It doesn't matter. We might be thinking, it's like, why not me, right? They have nothing above me, or, or, or you know, they have, they're, they're, they, they shouldn't have that advantage. And, and inside of our hearts, we might be hiding or concealing these feelings of jealousy and envy. The Muslims of Medina made dua for that. They said, Ya Allah, do not make in our hearts any rancor. Cleanse our hearts of any rancor or any jealousy or any ill feelings. For who? For the ones who believe. What a beautiful dua. Beautiful dua. Because we might be suffering from this. What's the treatment? The antidote to these ill feelings we might have in our hearts. Because we're human beings. Allah says, just ask me. Ask me to cleanse your heart because that's an exalted thing. That's a beautiful thing. Allah wants our hearts to become pure. So that we can receive his gifts, his bounties, his pleasure. See, the one who's concerned about the pleasure of Allah, remember, this is a sort of glorifications of Allah, reverence for Allah. The one who's thinking about Allah, when they have an issue in their hearts, they start asking Allah to help them with it. So it's okay to have something in the heart, but it's not okay to act on it. And it's not okay not to seek Allah's help. So these people said, Allah, praise them and he said they used to make dua all the time for Allah to cleanse their hearts because they were interested in Allah's pleasure they were concerned about missing out on Allah's pleasure and and his promise of good for them so they said ya Allah whatever feelings we have in our hearts cleanse it completely cleanse it empty our hearts of any ill or any rancor for any believer that's why they were able to smile because Allah is working their hearts and they were sincere so Allah put that joy in their hearts when they discovered that they're not going to receive any of the spoils of war, any of the spoils of war. Interestingly enough, the notion of ghil, that rancor in the heart, that, that ill feelings in the heart, Allah speaks of another time in our journeys where the hearts will be cleansed and it's in Jannah. It's in Jannah. min ghil. Allah says the people of Jannah, their hearts are completely cleansed of rancor, of ill feelings. So whenever we have ill feelings in our hearts, rancor, bitterness, hate, and want to act on it, and want to go harm somebody or have ill intentions for them, remember that the people of Jannah, their hearts are cleansed. That the believers, at least they need to be asking Allah to cleanse their hearts because a heart that is full of rancor and hate and bitterness and jealousy, etc., 
is not a heart that Allah is pleased with. And if we want the pleasure of Allah, we need to start working on our hearts. And, and if we can't, ask Allah for help. And if whatever is in your heart is going to correspond to a condition in Jannah. So if you are desiring that heart in Jannah that is so pure, then it's time for us to start working on our hearts from now. Allah continues on by saying, أَلَمْ تَرَأْ لِلَّذِينَ نَافَقُوا يَقُولُونَ لِإِخْوَانِهِمَ الَّذِينَ كَفْرُمْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَنْ أُخْرِجْتُمْ لَنَخْرُجَنَّ مَعَكُمْ Allah goes back to the, to the incident and he tells us, uh, did you see how these people who are hypocrites in Medina, they gave a false promise to their brothers from the disbelievers, meaning Banu Nadir from the people of the book. They promised and they said, don't worry. If you were driven out, uh, the Muslims of Medina, we're going to be with you. We're going to go with you out. We're going to leave Medina ourselves. And if you are um, fought by the Muslims, we're going to fight with you. Remember that false promise? But no, they thought they, they counted on it. They said, oh, we're going to be protected. Oh, the, the people, some of the people of Medina will side with us. But they were hypocrites. Allah Azza wa says, have you seen this? Then in verse 12, he said, they're not going to go out with them. That was a false promise. And they're not going to fight with them. Allah is revealing the truth. What happened? Indeed, they didn't show up. They didn't show up for a fight when they were besieged. And when the people of um, Banu Nadir left, the people, the hypocrites of Medina didn't go with them. They're hypocrites. They lie. Just as the people of Banu Nadir lied, they're hiding these wicked intentions. Allah says it's all wicked. It's all selfish motives. The alliance was a false alliance. It's not a real bond. And indeed, anything, not for the sake of Allah, is going to fall apart. So these alliances that are built on evil, motivated by evil, will collapse. It's only a matter of time. Then Allah Azza wa says in verse 14, they'll never fight you except from behind fortified uh, uh, towns or, fo or strong forts because they are afraid. Allah's telling us people who have no faith in their hearts, the hypocrites, inside of them, they're actually very terrified. You might think they're strong, but they're not. قلوبهم تحسبهم جميعا وقلوبهم شتا You think they're united, but their hearts are scattered and divided. This event reveals that. That Banu Nadir and the hypocrites of Medina and Quraysh, their alliance was a very loose alliance. They looked like they were united on the surface, but inside they had no relationships, no love, no affection, no care for each other. So when it really mattered, when the heat of battle showed up, they left each other. That's the action of the shaitan. The shaitan makes false promises and then doesn't deliver at the end. Then Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in verse 16, He says the example of what they've experienced, their false alliance, their false promises to each other, is like the promise of the shaitan who tells the human being, disbelieve in Allah, take partners with Allah, worship other than Allah. The shaitan beautifies it, beautifies the thought of ingratitude to Allah, beautifies wickedness. And he says, who cares about faith? Who cares about religion? These are losers who do this, right? Enjoy life. And he beautifies it and gives you that false hope. Then at the end, what happens? When it's over, when life is going to be over, we're going to see the truth. Now, the shaitan promised you something, promised me something. We thought, you know, his, his plans are, are the ones that are, that are going to give us gain. And it appears in that moment that the, uh, the shaitan himself is a friend, even though people don't call him the shaitan. Because the shaitan can manifest in also in the form of human beings, right? And there are human beings who are shayateen themselves. They're devils. Allah calls them devils. Devils from ins, from human beings, and devils from the jinn. When it's over, they don't show up. In Nibari Omek, worse, the shaitan himself on the day of judgment will actually say, I don't know you. I'm free of you. I didn't ask you. I didn't compel you to do what you did. So no relationship, no bond. And even the shaitan himself, he says, I, I fear Allah Azza wa Jal. You're on your own, buddy. And then Allah Azza wa Jal concludes this surah in a beautiful way. Remember, this is a surah that shed light on a significant event of treachery, of wickedness. Allah spoke of his plan in it and how he executed it. So it's a surah at the end about what? Allah himself. It's a surah whose goal is to build that awareness in the heart. It's not just to learn a few details from the history of Medina and treachery and quote this information. 
That's not the goal of Allah. The goal of Allah is to teach the heart. For your heart and my heart to become aware of Allah. So Allah wraps up the surah where he began. He began the surah by what? He began the surah by declaring that everything in the heavens and on earth glorifies Allah. Because Allah is, remember, the two qualities or attributes mentioned in verse 1, Al-Azizul Hakim. He is the one with full authority and sovereignty. He's the infinitely wise. So his will is the only one that matters. And he's the only reality and truth that matters. So why are our hearts not glorifying him? So Allah wraps up the surah by shedding light on himself again. And now taking us to a beautiful journey to remind us that what matters is the heart and its awareness of Allah Azza wa Jal. So Allah Azza wa Jal in verse 18 issues a command to the believers, a command to the believers, the ones who claim to have faith. He says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, ittaqu allaha wal tanzur nafsum na qaddamat li ghadi wa attaqu allah. Inna allaha khabirun bima ta'amalun. Wa la takunu ka ladina nasu allaha fa ansahum anfusahum ulaika humul fasiqun. And command from Allah. He says this, O oh, you who believe, Listen up. Here's what matters. What matters at the end? Ittaqullah. Have in your heart God consciousness. Be conscious of Allah. Taqwa is translated usually as fear of Allah, conscious of Allah, but it's much, much more than that. Taqwa is to put up a barrier between you and something to protect you. Do we need protection from Allah? Allah is the protector. No. Allah is saying, put up a protection. If you really revere me as Al-Aziz, the most exalted, if you really appreciate who Allah is, and Allah can never be grasped. His power, His wisdom, His knowledge, His mercy, and uh, His ability, it's infinite, it's unbounded. We'll never appreciate it, understand it fully. But if we had some awareness of it, then we're going to understand that the pleasure of Allah is the only pleasure that matters. And that His punishment is real as well. And accountability. So we'll want to put up a barrier that protects us from that torment, possible torment, if we, you know, insisted on our evil mistakes, etc. We'll be so terrified of really the fulfillment of any of that punishment against us, but also we'll be terrified and afraid that Allah will not be happy with us. Will not be happy because his ma- his pleasure is the only pleasure that matters. So the believer who is in love with Allah, who adores, reveres Allah, is constantly thinking, how do I protect myself against losing the pleasure of Allah? How do I protect myself against losing the pleasure of Allah? So every time they come to decide on something, instead of thinking what's in it for me, what pleases me, they're thinking what pleases Allah? What pleases Allah? Crossing that red line, hurting a human being. Ah, oh, You know what? That might satisfy my pleasure now. It's going to displease Allah. That's taqwa. In Ramadan, you're about to, uh, you're hungry and nobody's watching. You're like, I can sneak in a bite, uh, a, a, you know, a sip of water. You know, Muslims don't do that usually, at least the majority. What's happening? It's actually taqwa. In that instant, when the shaitan might have beautified something, it's like, oh, go ahead and do it. Nobody's seeing. Nobody's seeing. The heart says, no, I see Allah. And if I break my fast right now, Allah will be displeased with me. That's taqwa. Awareness of Allah that you put up a barrier to protect you against this displeasure because you care for Allah so much. So Allah is asking them to do that. He says, hasn't the time come for you to have taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal? Ittaqullah. But it's not enough to have reverence in Allah for Allah in our hearts. Allah wants action. Allah wants a, a heart that is soft, that is aware of Allah, that respects Allah, that is conscious of Allah, that thinks of Allah with every word and ac- action that we do. And that when we stumble, we also seek his forgiveness. It's part of that taqwa. Because we recognize we have none but Allah. But Allah says, start act, start planning, start, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, working on your actions. Start doing things for the next world. So he says, let every soul look at what they've prepared and what they've offered for the next world, for tomorrow. Allah is reminding us here, it's not enough to just sit on your feelings and emotions and faith. You got to act on it and start working. For what? He says, look to, to tomorrow. And tomorrow is not here. Tomorrow is the next world. Allah says, plan for that. That should be your, 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 you know, how your time is spent for the rest of your journey. Feeling in the heart for Allah, faith in Allah, but also plan and action 
throughout the time that is remained for you before tomorrow comes. Remember at the beginning of the halqa we said, we have no idea what today holds. Our brother Abdullah was with us last Sunday morning attending this session. Maybe you, maybe you were not aware of this. SubhanAllah. Had his plan for the day. He had meetings that day. Um, and SubhanAllah, whatever plans he had, that was going to be the last day of his life. Somebody we know very closely. We love so closely. SubhanAllah. By the end of the day, he passed away. And he never saw that, that tomorrow. He's not going to see Ramadan. He was with Allah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. May Allah put him in Jannah. May Allah put all the believers in Jannah and comfort them because their journey of trouble is over. So Alhamdulillah, we take consolation from that. But remember, tomorrow might never come. Tomorrow is with Allah. There is a tomorrow, it's with Allah. Allah says, plan for it with action. Action with your limbs are very important and Allah witnesses them. And then he said, do not be like those who only talk, who forget Allah. And Allah makes them forget themselves. Remember, the only truth, the only reality is Allah. The only thing that matters is Allah. What happens if we forget Allah? We forget that we came from Him. To Him we return. We forget that He is the only sovereign one. He is the forgiving one. He is the merciful one. We forget that and we think all there is is, is this life. That's the only reality. Allah says, you lose yourselves. Because you're going to end up harming yourself, hurting yourself. Because you're working for this world and for your pleasures. So you actually end up doing things that hurt you without you knowing. You forget yourself. You forget what benefits you. You know what tells us what benefits us? Not us. Us, we'll hurt ourselves. We have delusions. We don't know what's good, what's bad. The shaitan is on top of you and me day and night, never leaves us. He's our sworn enemy. And he'll make sure we hurt ourselves. We act on the worst impulses, on desires. He'll seduce us so that we can eat from the tree like Adam did. In that moment when Adam ate from the tree, he forgot himself even what was good for him because of the lure of the shaitan. Allah says, don't be like those who forget Allah, that Allah makes them forget themselves. Those are the wicked ones. Every moment we forget Allah, we act on our impulses and the seductions. We hurt ourselves. It's a moment when we actually forgot ourselves and hurt ourselves. Then Allah Azza wa says, they are not equal. The people of paradise and the, equal, the people of the hellfire are not equal. Indeed, the people of paradise, humul farizun. At the end, what matters is the next world. This world, don't worry about the appearances of it and who's winning and who's not winning, who's triumphing and who's not triumphing. Sometimes that gets us, right? How come justice is not served, etc.? How come the wicked have the upper hand? The lessons don't worry. All of this is going to end. It's all temporary and fleeting. What matters is who is it, who's winning at the end, because that's eternal. So he says, the people of Jannah are the absolute winners. Everybody else is a loser. Then he says, in ending the surah, Beautiful, beautiful example. And also an analogy in it. Allah says, if we were to reveal this Quran, Quran means all the words of the Quran, the meanings of the Quran, right? Everything in it, the truth of the Quran. If it was to be sent down onto a mountain, what would happen to the mountain? Allah says the mountain, you would find that mountain to be so softened with khushu', with tranquility and serenity. And that mountain will start to crack and split out of what khashyat, out of awareness and reverence and fear of Allah. And these are the examples and the analogies we give to people for them to think. So it's an analogy. What is Allah saying? Allah says, what's the greatest thing you can see that has, you know, imminence to it, apparent power and height? Mountains, they're very high. You know, looking at top them physically. They're, you know, think of Mount Everest, think of all these incredible mountains that are the pegs of this earth. They are emblems of power, of glory, but they're also hard. On their exterior, they're hard. So they're high and, high and, and hard. Allah says, this is the highest thing you can see, the strongest thing you can see, the hardest shell you can see. If the Quran was to re be revealed to it if, it, if it received that revelation, that truth from the Quran, that height will be humbled be before the sublimity of the Quran. The, the, the mountain itself will be like shrink, bring its head down, its hide down, 
out of softness for what? Out of humility, excuse me, for the height of the Quran, the nobility of the Quran, it will be touched by it. And the heart shell will start to crack and soften. Wow, the mouth will start to cry. The mountain will be humbled out of awareness and reverence for Allah. If, if the words of the Quran touched it, Allah is saying, how about you and me? Are you as high as the, as the mountain? As you as hard as a mountain? So if we're not being humbled and our hearts are not cracking out of softness, reverence for Allah, then something is wrong with the human being. Something is wrong with the human being. It's a beautiful analogy that also informs us about the impact that the heart should have, the, the impact that the Quran should have on our hearts. When we read the Quran, and that's one of the blessings of coming on Sunday mornings to reflect on the Quran. The month of the Quran is coming in less than a week. The goal of Ramadan, the goal of the Allah behind the Quran is to make the hard shell of human being soften. And for this haughty human being who's so full of himself and ego to be humbled out of awareness of who? Allah, Allah, Allah because he's the only thing that matters. The one who lost awareness of this, who forgot Allah, they become arrogant, full of themselves. They think they're like as high as a mountain. And Allah says they're not even being affected by the message. That means it's a dead, blind heart. So Allah wraps up the surah with two verses. These verses actually stand as some of the most glorious in the Quran, among the most glorious in the Quran that we need to not only reflect on, we can memorize. They contain they contain the greatest collection, or the the only verses that contain the 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 most kind of comprehensive collection of the attributes of Allah. So there you're not going to find as many names of Allah collected in two verses, uh, consecutive verses, one after the other, like you will see in these two verses. And they're going to end crown the surah. Why? Why would Allah now take talk about sixteen names of His? Sixteen names. Remember, this is a surah about Allah. It is to bring awareness in our hearts about who Allah is in his nature. It's another introduction to Allah for you and me, so that we really know who Allah is, so that what? The hearts will start to soften. The hearts will start to soften. Because if we don't know who Allah is, how are we going to revere him? So what's your conception of Allah? The conception of Allah has to be founded on something about Allah. We have different opinions of Allah, different thoughts about Allah. Maybe Allah is limited in our minds. Maybe, you never know. Maybe we're angry with Allah sometimes. Maybe we doubt his wisdom. Allah, once again, reintroduces us to him because that's the only thing that matters. Remember, in Ramadan, that's what's going to matter. Have we come closer to Allah in our awareness of him? So Allah says this. هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم forgive me I made a mistake it's actually three verses not two that contain this beautiful glorious summary of the names of Allah عز وجل. so Allah says this I'm going to translate it and wrap it it is Allah هو هو means he the only one that matters is هو Allah Everything else is a shadow. Allah, the name of the personal name of Allah that contains all the other attributes. In verse 22, the first of the three verses, Allah says about himself the following: La ilaha illallah, no God but He. The most important reality to anchor in our hearts: no God but Allah. Then he says about himself, three attributes: Alimul Ghaibi wa Shahada, the knower of what is hidden and what is manifest, what is witnessed. So he knows everything inside out. Very important to know about Allah. So it means he knows our hearts. So the first verse contains something about the essence of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. These are the most important qualities to know about Allah, that he is infinitely, unboundedly compassionate and merciful with all of us, with all of creation. That's one thing Allah really wants you to know about him. And that he's intimately aware and knowledgeable. He doesn't, nothing is missed on Allah. Nothing is lost on Allah. He knows things inside out. Very important to know about Allah. Then in the next verse, he segs into other types of attributes about his actions with us. He says, Hu Allah again, emphasizing Allah, it is only He. La ilaha illallah, repeating the thing he said in the first verse. There is no God but He, because that's the only thing that really matters for you and me to know. 
that he says, Huwa al-Malik al-Quddus al-Salam al-Mu'min. It is he the sovereign, al-Malik. There is no sovereign but Allah. So sovereign also means the one who doesn't need anyone and everybody else needs him. Everybody needs the king. Allah reminds us, do you see me as the sovereign? Do you see me as the only God? Do you see me as the one who knows everything inside out? Al-Quddus, another name of Allah. What does Quddus mean? It's translated as the holy. But it really means inside of it, the one who has no flaws, no blemishes. The one whose reality transcends our opinions and conceptions of him. No matter what you think, and I think about Allah, when we sit by ourselves, he's higher than that. That's Quddus. He's so holy. He transcends our thoughts and conceptions about him. No matter how perfect you think he is, he's even more perfect. That's an amazing thing. No matter how much you think he's merciful, he's more merciful. He's more forgiving than you think, than I think. He's more powerful than you think and I think. Al-Quddus. As-Salam. He's the source of peace. He is the peace. Without a blemish inside of him. Without any contradiction in his nature. It's so perfect inside. It's all, it's, it has fullness to it. And he is the peace himself. All peace is from Allah to Allah. It can only come from him. Al-Mu'min. Al-Mu'min is understood as a believer. Yet it's the name of Allah. In this case, Allah is not a believer. But he's the one who grants security and belief. So the one who puts belief in your heart is Allah, Al-Mu'min, reminding us faith comes from him. And the protection of the faith comes from him. Al-Muhaymin, what is Al-Muhaymin? It means the preserver, the one who really preserves our security and safety. The one who watches over everyone and every creature is Al-Muhaymin. Allah reminds us, he's protecting us. He's watching over every single one of us. Al-Aziz, remember? The surah started with that. Al-Aziz means the mighty, the exalted and might, the sovereign one. The one who's so exalted in mind, nobody can reach him. Nobody can reach him. His power is infinite, but it stands above everybody else, and nobody can even come close to Allah if Allah doesn't want, right? Aziz, unique in his mind and his power. Jabbar. And Jabbar means the one who heals, but also the one who compels, meaning that the will of Allah and his power overpowers everything. Nobody can stand against or to change the will of Allah and his plans. Al-Mutakabbir. Mutakabbir means the one who is so uh, glorified, who's so noble, who's so proud, uniquely proud. He, he, he can be proud of Allah. Infinitely proud because he's on top of everybody else and everybody is underneath him. Mutakabbir. So he sits on top of everybody. Subhanallah. Allah says, say Subhanallah. Glorify Allah. Indeed, Allah is glorified above everything that they take um, that they attribute to him, all the negative things that human beings can attribute, Allah says, I'm above it. Allah wraps up the surah by another three attributes of his. Pertaining to his creative power and energy. So Allah says, Huwa Allahu al-Khaliqu al-Bari'u al-Musawwar. Three names that come together oftentimes. It is he, Allah, again, Huwa Allah, the only reality, who is the creator. Al-Bari is the one who initiates you know, begins the process of creating, bad it from nothing. He initiates the process of creating. al Musawir, who after he initiates the creation of a being or, or of anything, he gives it form. Musawir, surah means picture. al Musawir is the one who gives a picture, means he gives form. He gives the characteristics of the thing he creates it uh, that, that would be suitable for the mission of that thing he created. So he created us, he gave us the form, the shape of the hands, the shape of the eyes, the location of the brain, the location of the heart, all the things that come with your form, it's from al musawwir so that you can fulfill your function. Then he says, Lahul Asma'ul Husna, to Allah belongs all the beautiful names. Then he wraps up the surah by saying, Yusabbihu lahu ma fis samawati wal ard. Allah indeed, remember the beginning of the surah, Allah. Everything glorifies Allah Azza wa Jal. So we and I should do that. وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ And it is He, the exalted in might, the infinitely wise, the two attributes that He began the surah with. Again, the meaning of all of this, the lesson is that we really should be in a state of reverence. Our hearts should be humble and crack out of reverence for the one whose attributes are these. That's why Allah keeps emphasizing these attributes. To reshape our conception of Him and produce that sense of awe in the heart that you and I, night and day, will start to say, SubhanAllah, 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 it's the greatest gift indeed. I stop here and I'll 
take your questions. Uh, your, you can send uh, something in the chat. Yes, Tarif, thank you. Uh, I'll turn it over actually, Roman. Yeah, so you can put it in the chat and I can unmute uh, the person. We have like 30 people on the call right now. So you can, uh, there's a question from um, about the, on the chat already, if you want to answer that. Sure. So when Allah speaks of the Quran being revealed onto a mountain, it would shatter into pieces. What does that mean? First of all, um, remember, I'll remind you of what happened to a mountain, literally to a mountain. When Allah exposed a ray of his light, that was an incident uh, in the life of Musa alayhi salam. What did Musa say? Remember, Allah cannot be grasped. No matter what we think, remember Allah says, Qudus, he's above our conceptions, above our attributions. That's why we, we always have to say, Subhana, Subhana. Subhana is, he's perfect above even my imperfect thoughts about him. Think well of Allah. Musa said, Ya Allah, show me. Show me you. Show yourself to me. I want to see you. Allah says, I, you can't see me, Musa. Okay, so let me teach you something, Musa. Look at that mountain. Mountain. Keep looking at it. If the mountain is able